This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet wasallam in an attempt to learn about him, to love him, and to better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at the Sirah Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the ultimate mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. So insha'Allah, as part of the uh, Sira Intensive, we're going to be going through a systematic study of the Shama'il Muhammadiyah, the descriptions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, what I've done is I've allocated a number of ahadith or chapters uh, for each of the days, insha'Allah, that we're going to be having the dars, the lesson. Uh, again, insha'Allah, we're going to not sacrifice quality for the sake of quantity. Uh, so we will slow down the pace if it requires uh, us understanding uh, more properly and discussing properly, inshallah, what the narrations are pertaining to and what they're talking about. As is the case in the um, start of any subject or topic, particularly when we are studying from a text, there are some introductory things that need to be understood and covered. First and foremost, the name of the text itself. And this is the first of its type of compilation. It was the original. Um, so in the early studies of hadith and in the early studies of the life of the Prophet wasallam, initially it was just done, generally speaking, a bunch of different narrations pertaining to different aspects of the life of the Prophet wasallam would be compiled together. After that, basically around the third century of Islam, the scholars started focusing uh, different books, different writings for very specific aspects of the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the first compilation of its type. That does not mean that these narrations were not documented before this. They most definitely were documented prior to this. But this was the first time that a compilation, a, a book, was dedicated to this particular area of study and focus on the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And so this book is typically known by a couple of different titles. The actual title of the book is Ash-Shama'il, uh, Ash-Shama'il Muhammadiyah or Shama'il Muhammadiyah. Some later on it's very frequently and commonly referred to as Shama'il Tirmidhi. Tirmidhi is the name of the author and I'll be telling you a little bit more about him in just a minute. So the text itself is called Shama'il Muhammadiyah. Shama'il Muhammadiyah, so let's first understand exactly, because again, it's one of those words that gets thrown around, but a lot of times people don't know exactly what the word refers to. The word Shama'il is plural of the word Shimal. The word Shimal, now it might sound familiar to some, linguistically speaking, uh, we know that a lot of times it refers to the left hand side, Yameen Shimal, alright? So you have right and left. However, the case, the, the fact of the matter in the Arabic language, when you study ilmul ishtiqaq, when you study de, de, uh, derivatives and derivation of words, and finding the root and the origin of words, what you find a lot of times is certain root words, while they generally have a particular meaning, there is a lot of times maybe one usage of the word that is an offshoot. A usage of a word that has a completely different meaning. And a lot of times for beginner students, that's something that is very hard for them to grasp. Like how can this one derivative or this one uh, particular noun that comes from the same exact root 
not be congruent with the rest of the meaning, right? Uh, would be, well, how can it not fit in with all the other different usages of the word? But what you have to understand is that the Arabic language, like any other language, is a language. It is people-based, and the language is not determined by us and our usage of the dictionary. And what seems very convenient for us in terms of looking up the roots of words. A language is based on the usage of the people who spoke that language to begin with. And so the Arabs, the ancient Arabs, they tell us what the word means, not the other way around. And so the word shamal would also refer to the temperament, the, um, the temperament, the attitude, the conduct, the behavior of an individual. So when you would refer to someone, you would say shamaluhu, a tabuhu, tabiatuhu, his character or his personality, right? His temperament. And so as a good definition, what you can understand is that the word shamal refers to personality. And the plural of this word is shama'il. Shama'il. وَلِذَلِكَ يُجْمَعُوا عَلَىٰ خِلَافِ الْقِيَاسِ And that's why, typically that is not the plural of the word, of this type of a form, but that's why the plural of this is in a more unique form, shama'il. And therefore it refers to characteristics, traits, fundamental aspects of one's personality. And so shama'il muhammadiyya refers to the prophetic personality. The prophetic personality. And so the title of the text is The Prophetic Personality. And so Imam Tirmidhi, who is the author, so a little bit again about the book before we, I get into the author. This particular book has 56 chapters covering all different aspects of the prophetic personality. It has 400 and some odd narrations. If you were uh, to narrow it down to only the unique narrations, more unique narrations, then it has 396 unique narrations. But if you were to look at any type of repetitions that are available, that are, that are present in the book, then there are 415 narrations uh, overall. So there are 415 ahadith or narrations that are mentioned in the text. If you uh, omit the repetitions, uh, then there are 396 unique narrations within the text, spanning over or divided into 56 different chapters. And inshallah, I hope to be able to cover uh, for here, uh, for our group, inshallah, I hope to be able to cover at least half of them, inshallah. The different narrations, there's some discussion, but I'm not going to get into a lot of this because this is a more technical discussion of usul hadith. But the narrations are not only the words of the Prophet ﷺ, the actions of the Prophet ﷺ, but they are also observations. Right? Just observations about the Prophet ﷺ. So from that particular aspect, a lot of them could be referred to as, technically speaking, what we call mawquf, mawqufat, mawaqif that these are narrations of the companions about the Prophet ﷺ. But because they are still about the Prophet ﷺ, it is still valid to call them a hadith, to call it the sunnah, to refer to it as a hadith or the sunnah. Because it is pertaining to the Prophet ﷺ. Now a little bit about the author, Imam At-Tirmidhi, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, he's typically known as Imam At-Tirmidhi. So I'll tell you a little bit about him. His name is Muhammad ibn Isa, Ibn Sawra, Ibn Musa, Ibn ad So Muhammad, the son of Isa, the grandson of Sawra, the great-grandson of Musa, the great-great-grandson of Dahak. So this is Imam At-Tirmidhi. His, his laqab, or rather his kunniya, rather his kunniya was Abu Isa. He was known as Abu Isa. So after his father, he named his son Isa as well. And so he would oftentimes go by Abu Isa, Imam Abu Isa at-Tirmidhi. His nisba, nisba basically means his connection. So he had a couple of different uh, nisbas that are mentioned for him. The first one is Sulami. as sulami And that refers to the tribe that he belonged to. The second nisba that is mentioned for him is Al-Bughi. Al-Bughi. He was from a very small town, a village by the name of Bugh. And then finally, he's known as a Tirmidhi. Tirmid, or some mention that the original pronunciation of the name of the town, the city, was Turmud. Turmud or Tirmid was an old city 
that is not really existent in its original form any longer. It was an old city, an ancient city that was on the banks of the Balkh River in Afghanistan, modern day Afghanistan. So based off of that, what we know about Imam Tirmidhi is that he was, he was what we would call Afghani. He was from the region that we know as modern day, current day Afghanistan. And there's actually even some discussion that he ethnically belonged to the Turkmen people. He was Turkmen. And so he, that's basically where Imam Tirmidhi hailed from, that's where he came from. Another very common laqab that is mentioned for Imam Tirmidhi is that he's referred to as Ad-Darir. Ad-Darir. Darir refers to somebody who becomes blind later on in their life. Who becomes blind later on in their life. And so Imam Tirmidhi, later on in his life, he lost his eyesight. And that's primarily attributed to, of course, obviously just physical you know, ailments and getting old, but also because of his intense study and the amount of stress that he endured in just the study and the research and the compilation of hadith, that that contributed to the loss of his eyesight. Imam Tirmidhi rahimullah ta'ala was born in the year 210 after Hijrah. So he was basically born two centuries after the passing of the Prophet wasallam. Imam Tirmidhi was of course raised um, in that region of Central Asia. And he primarily benefited from the scholars of Central Asia. Now the thing that you have to know about Central Asia at that particular time is, it basically was the hub of knowledge in that era. Particularly when it came to the science of hadith. Other notable scholars of Central Asia were Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. And they are the two primary teachers of Imam Tirmidhi. He was able to learn and benefit from Imam Bukhari, Imam Tirmidhi. There's many other different uh, teachers of his that are mentioned. Qutaybat ibn Sa'id, Ali ibn Hujr, Ibn uh, Bashar, and other teachers. But his two primary teachers were of course Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, rahimahumallahu ta'ala. Imam Tirmidhi also uh, had some very notable students, Abu Bakr as samarqandi Ahmad uh, Hasnawi, uh, Asad al-Nasafi, Farbari, Mirwazi. These are some very notable scholars of hadith. Al-Farbari, Al-Mirwazi, these are all very notable scholars of hadith and they were all students of Imam Tirmidhi. And Al-Mirwazi is the primary narr- narrator from Imam Tirmidhi himself. Just a little bit about him, because I don't want to get into too much detail here. Uh, a little bit about one very powerful testament to the uh, notoriety or the qualifications of a scholar are what other scholars basically have to say about him, including contemporaries. Imam Bukhari, rahimullahu ta'ala, he says to Ima, about Imam Tirmidhi, he actually said to Imam Tirmidhi, مَن تَفَعَتُ بِكَ أَكْثَرْ مِمَّن تَفَعَتَ بِكَ مَا إِن تَفَعَتُ بِكَ أَكْثَرْ مِمَّن تَفَعَتَ بِي that I benefited from you a lot more than you benefited from me. Ibn Hibban, who is from again one of the most notable of hadith scholars, he says, Kana Abu Isa mimman jamma'a wa sannafa wa hafidha wa dhakara. That Imam Tirmidhi is from amongst the scholars of hadith who compiled, who wrote the ahadith down, he memorized the ahadith, and he was a teacher of hadith. Uh, Abu Sa'd al Idrisi, he says, كان أبو عيسى يضرب به المثل في الحفظ. That if you wanted to give an example, like if you wanted to say somebody had an amazing memory, you would say he's like Imam Tirmidhi. Saying that someone was like Imam Tirmidhi was saying that this person has remarkable memory. Actually, the title that is given to Imam Tirmidhi um, by his contemporaries in terms of his stature uh, in narrating a hadith is that he is called Al-Hafid. Al-Hafid Al-Tirmidhi. Now what does Hafid refer to? These definitions are not completely precise, but generally speaking there is kind of an agreement between classical hadith scholars about some of the titles. Hafid was the title that would be bestowed upon, Al-Hafid would be bestowed upon someone who had memorized at least a minimum of a hundred thousand ahadith with their chain of narration and the text of the hadith. So Imam Tirmidhi had more than a hundred thousand hadith to his credit that he had memorized and that he had taught and narrated. Imam Hakim, 
uh, An Naysaburi, another great remarkable scholar of hadith, he says that I used to hear teachers talking about Imam Tirmidhi and they would say, Mat al Bukhari, when Bukhari died, Falam yukhallif bi Khurasan mithla abi Isa fil ilmi wal hifdi wal wari wal zuhd. That when Imam Bukhari died, basically the heir apparent to Imam Bukhari in that entire region of Central Asia was. Imam Tirmidhi, and there was nobody else like him in terms of knowledge, memorization, piety, and asceticism. That he was somebody who just was not very interested in material things. Baka hatta amiya. He cried until he lost his eyes. Wa baka dariran sinin. And he lived for a number of years after that without his eyesight. Another uh, as samaani says, Ahadul a'imma allati yuqtada bihim fi ilm al-hadith. He is one of the leaders in the science of hadith, and all other students of hadith follow Imam Tirmidhi in hadith. صَنَّفَ كِتَابَ الْجَامِعَ وَالتَّوَارِيخِ وَالْعِلَلْ تَصْنِيفَ رَجُلٍ عَالِمٍ مُتْقِنٍ That he authored these compilations of hadith, and these are the compilations and the books written by a very pious, notable scholar. وَكَانَ يُضْرَبُ بِهِ الْمِثْلِ فِي الْحِفْظِ وَالضَّبْتِ um, And... Uh, Imam al-Dhahabi, rahimahullahu ta'ala, who is one of the primary critiquers of hadith and was actually known to be quite stringent in his critique of people who narrated hadith and a hadith itself. He says about Imam Tirmidhi, al-Hafidh, al-Alam, al-Imam, al-Bari'ah. That he is a scholar of the highest caliber when it comes to hadith. He is a landmark scholar of the science, and he is an imam, someone that should be followed in his knowledge, and he is someone who is extremely nuanced in his understanding. ثِقَةٌ مُجْمَعٌ عَلَيْهِ That he is a reliable source of knowledge, and there is an ijma, that there is a consensus, scholarly consensus on the fact that Imam Tirmidhi is a reliable source of knowledge, that we can take knowledge from him. مَا رَأَيْتُ مِثْلَهُ He says that I myself in my lifetime, from what I know about him, I have not come across a scholar of the caliber of Imam Tirmidhi. Ibn Kathir rahmahullah ta'ala says, هُوَ أَحَدُ أَئِمَّةُ هَذَا الشَّأْنِ فِي زَمَانِهِ That he basically was one of the rare scholars of his time. And another, uh, Abu Ya'la, who is another scholar of hadith, he similarly says that, مُتَّفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ That he is somebody whose authenticity is agreed upon. That anything that comes from Imam Tirmidhi is something that we are uh, very confident in. Now, Imam Tirmidhi, rahimahullah ta'ala, while there's a lot more that's said about him, the Shama'il of Tirmidhi, so Imam Tirmidhi has a few books uh, to his credit that are very well known. The first is of course, al Jami' al-Sunan, known as the Jami' of Imam Tirmidhi. Sunan al-Tirmidhi, Jami' al-Tirmidhi, al Jami' al-Sunan. Right, it's a compilation of hadith, and it's one of uh, the six major works of hadith um, that are taught throughout the world even till today. The second book that he has to his credit is Kitab al-Ilal, where he provided an analysis of how a hadith are critiqued, and how to find the hidden defects within the chain of narrations that a lot of times even very... Qualified scholars of hadith are not able to find And he basically showed the methodology at arriving At some of these criticisms or critiques Of some of the change of narrations And of course the Shama'il is his other very notable work The Shama'il itself Scholars have praised this work uh, Imam Ibn Kathir Rahmullah Ta'ala says قَدْ صَنَّفَ النَّاسُ فِي هَذَا قَدِيمًا وَحَدِيثًا كُتُبٌ كَثِيرًا مُفْرَدًا وَغَيْرْ مُفْرَدًا That many different scholars have authored text in regards to the prophetic personality and the description of the Prophet ﷺ. But nobody wrote a better text or compiled a better compilation of a hadith in regards to the prophetic description than Imam Tirmidhi did. And so on and so forth, many different scholars have praised this particular compilation of Imam Tirmidhi. The text of Imam Tirmidhi has explanations have been written for it. Classically speaking, there are up to 25 different explanations, shuruh, that have been written for this particular text. So it's such a landmark work that basically scholar after scholar in almost every generation of Islam has written an explanation, a very thorough explanation of this particular text. And it's something that has been taught by scholars far and wide. Imam Tirmidhi, finally he passed away in the year 279. He passed away in the year 279, um, and he was buried 
um, in the same town, the same village that he was born in, of Bugh, on the outskirts of the major city of Turmud at that time. So this is a little bit about Imam Tirmidhi. So this is the text that he's written. Now as I mentioned to you before, that Imam uh, Tirmidhi has put 56 different chapters in this text. The very first chapter that we're going to be looking at, if you can look in your text, is Babu ma ja'a fi khalqi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now I want you to make very specific note of the pronunciation. Now khuluq, khuluq refers to character, conduct, uh, mannerisms, and that's something that we are going to be talking about in a lot of detail. But this is here referring to the physical description of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Babu ma ja'a fi khalqi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The physical qualities of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's a very interesting point that some of the scholars discuss. You know, a lot of times we talk about that the exterior is not what matters as much as the interior. That it's not the physical description or the physical, um, you know, manifestation of a person, meaning their, their physical attributes, their physical description. That's not as what is important as is that person's character. The character is what really defines a person. The actions are what define a person and their worth and their value. Why did Imam Tirmidhi mention the physical traits of the Prophet ﷺ before talking about his character? Or before talking about his actions or his attributes in terms of his, his uh, conduct, his manners? Why would, he describe, why would he mention his physical description first? So the scholars mentioned that what Imam Tirmidhi is trying to describe to us is he's trying to provide a very intimate, a very natural, a very organic, if you will, experience and interaction with the Prophet ﷺ. So if you, he's trying to give you as close of an experience as to actually physically interacting with the Messenger ﷺ. And so if you were to physically interact with the Prophet ﷺ, before you spoke to him, before you sat with him, before you interacted with him, the first thing you would do is you would see him. And so he's telling you what you would see. When you walked into the room, when you first walked through that door, what would your eyes fall upon? And what would you see? So he describes to you the man as you would see him, and then later on go on to interact with him. And then as he goes further, he becomes more and more intimate in the description of what he would wear, how he would eat, how he would sit, how he would walk, how he would talk, etc. So the first hadith that he mentions here, and so, excuse me, before I actually get into the first hadith, I almost forgot. I also just kind of wanted to mention, um, and this will be not too different than what we talked about earlier this morning, um, and that is, what are just obviously some of the benefits of studying um, the compilation of the Shama'il and specifically the physical descriptions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? That what are some of the benefits that uh, a student can get out of the, this particular course of study? So the scholars mention a number of different benefits. Obviously, first and foremost is again this gives you familiarity uh, with. The Prophet ﷺ allows you to almost start to visualize him and see him. And that's something that's extremely important in terms of developing love for the Messenger ﷺ. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described to us in the Quran, that that is something that is central to our iman and to our faith and belief. Uh, obedience is something that we are obligated uh, towards the Prophet ﷺ in regards to. And that type of obedience is, of course, born out of love. and that that love necessitates this type of familiarity. So it helps us to develop a sense of familiarity with the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, once we move past the physical description of the Prophet ﷺ, then we'll also be able to benefit from just overall studying the mannerisms, the character, the lifestyle, the daily routine, the conduct of the Prophet ﷺ, which gives us something very tangible to be able to base our own, um, you know, conduct and lifestyle um, and behavior upon. 
And so these are just some of the benefits in terms of why we're exactly uh, studying this text. It's to be able to better understand and know the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in the uh, introduction, many of the scholars when explaining this text, they said that Allah subhanahu wa taala, when you look at how, why do we, you know, somebody could find it even bizarre, somebody could find it kind of strange that we, you obsess over this man so much. Somebody could say, and there is actually some out lying even thoughts in the Muslim community that you know whether you call it um, traditional Muslims or practicing Muslims are a little too obsessed with the Prophet ﷺ. why do you talk about him so much why do you have to know what he looked like why do you care you know uh, exactly what his physical stature was like what bearing does that possibly have on you Right, so all we basically have to do is go to the Quran, go to the Book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala itself, and see how Allah describes the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, when describing the the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He says that ma dalla sahibukum wa ma khawa. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala absolves the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from having any type of deviant thinking. That he did not err in even his thinking and his approach to things. That his mind, his thoughts were pure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا كَذَبَ الْفُؤَادُ مَا رَآ That the sight of the Prophet ﷺ was pure. He saw what he saw. He was never fooled or tricked by his eyes. His eyes never played a trick on him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying about the Prophet ﷺ, He says, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوحَى His words were pure. His thoughts were pure, his heart was pure, his sight was pure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even goes as far as saying that his actions were dignified. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ That there came to you a messenger who was from amongst you, that he was very extremely bothered by the difficulty you experienced. That he was fully invested, he lived his life for the betterment of humanity and humanity's condition. He was extremely compassionate and merciful when dealing with the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala validates. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In kuntum tuhibun Allah, fattabi'uni yuhbibukum Allah. He tells the Prophet ﷺ to announce to the people that if you claim to love Allah, then follow the Messenger of Allah and Allah will love you. So the actions of the Prophet ﷺ were so dignified that they necessitate the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That somebody that embodies themselves with the actions of the Prophet ﷺ, that person becomes qualified and deserving of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, uh, actually the Qur'an itself in Surah Qalam, in Surah number 68 says, it was the second revelation of the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu wa innaka la ala khuluqin azim. That you are upon a very great, amazing character. You live life, you live life and you conduct yourself in the highest, of, by the highest of standards. And that's what Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha was alluding to in Babu Badil Wahi, Hadithu Badil Wahi, the hadith about the beginning of revelation, where Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha says about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not waste you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not ruin you. لَن يُضَيِّعَكَ اللَّهُ أَبَدًا لَنْ يُخْزِيَكَ اللَّهُ أَبَدًا Allah will never waste you, Allah will never um, ruin you. And she says, فَإِنَّكَ تَصِلُ الرَّحِمُ Because you maintain family relationships. وَتَكْسِبُ الْمَعْدُومُ You give to those who can, you take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. وَتَحْمِلُ الْكَلْبُ You lift the downfallen. وَتُعِينُ عَلَى نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ you show hospitality to your guest. And you are always willing to help in any type of a good cause. And so this is exactly why we study the Shama'il and it is not some infatuation or obsession with an individual. This is us learning how to become more beloved to Allah. As Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ We have a very clear methodology that we follow. 
that we study and we observe and we analyze and we implement every single aspect of the life of the Prophet ﷺ because that is, the, that is what is pleasing to Allah. So we emulate the Prophet ﷺ in obedience to Allah and to seek nearness and closeness to Allah and to become beloved to Allah. That we implement, we study and we implement the character of the Prophet ﷺ in order to be able to actualize the Qur'an within our lives. So we have a very clear understanding of our methodology and how everything is interconnected. That the study of the life of the Prophet ﷺ brings us closer to what Allah has asked of us in the Qur'an. So it's a very clear understanding. And it's very clearly connected all the way through. The, of course, as I've already mentioned, that the text itself of the Shama'il is described as, Yusafu هَذَا nabi Al-Kareem خِلْقَةً وَخُلُقًا That the physically, physically and in terms of mannerisms, the Prophet ﷺ will be described, فَيَتَحَدَّثُ عَنْ صِفَةِ أَكْلِهِ وَشُرْبِهِ وَدِرْعِهِ وَسَيْفِهِ وَكُحْلِهِ وَخِضَابِهِ وَشَعْرِهِ وَشَيْبِهِ وَنَعْلِهِ وَخُفِّهِ وَخَاتَمِهِ وَتَخَتُّمِهِ وَعَمَامَتِهِ وَمِغْفَرِهِ وَجُلُوسِهِ وَإِتِّكَائِهِ وَلِبَاسِهِ وَإِزَارِهِ وَفِي ضِحْكِهِ وَبُكَائِهِ وَكَلَامِهِ وَمَزَاحِهِ وَعِبَادَتِهِ وَنَوْمِهِ وَتَوَاضُعِهِ وَحَيَائِهِ وَإِدَامِهِ وَعَيْشِهِ وَوَفَاتِهِ وَرُؤْيَتِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. That in this text we'll be going through the study of not only the physical description of the Prophet ﷺ, but the description of his character. We will be talking about everything from how he ate to how he drank, how, how he went into battle, how he adorned himself and basically maintained and groomed himself. We'll be talking about what his hair looked like. We'll be talking about the type of shoes, the type of clothing that he wore, the type of ring that he wore, how he covered his head with a turban when he was at home, and how he covered his head in battle with a helmet. We'll be talking about how he sat and how he leaned back, how he laid down, how he dressed, how he laughed and how he cried. We'll be talking about how he spoke and how he joked. We'll be talking about how he worshipped, how he slept. His um, humility, his modesty, his dignity, what he ate, the lifestyle, the standard of life that he enjoyed. We'll be talking about how he passed away. We'll even be talking about the seeing of the Prophet ﷺ in a dream. And all of this is done. Why? At tashabbuh bihadha nabi al kareem wa tahalli bihulyatihi. وَبِحُلْيَتِهِ وَشَيْمِهِ وَالْإِئْتِمَارِ بِأَمْرِهِ وَالْإِنْتِهَاءَ عَمَّا نَهَا عَنْهُ وَزَجَرَ قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا That we'll be doing all of this in order to be able to embody the character and the spirit of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, how he lived his life, so that we can abide by the commands of Allah, and we can stay away from what God has prohibited, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, that you will find a complete precedent, an example, a role model, contained within the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is what leads to firmer faith in Allah, belief in the last day, and actually allows us to become nearer and closer, and to live a life of worship and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, now going to the first chapter, Babu ma ja'a fi khalqi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the chapter about the physical description of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first hadith, now uh, one of the things that I should mention to you here before we go any further, is that the vocabulary of the shama'il, this physical description of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the portrait of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in words. This is his portrait in words. The vocabulary is something that is very difficult. All right, It's actually very difficult vocabulary. And what that tells you is that even the contemporaries of the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, the, even though the Prophet ﷺ didn't use this type of vocabulary in his speech, not because the Prophet ﷺ was not capable of it, but because the Prophet ﷺ spoke in very clear words. Because the Prophet ﷺ focused on helping people understand what he was saying. So he spoke very clearly and very precisely and almost 
you know, with a simplistic beauty. There was beauty in the simplicity of how the Prophet ﷺ spoke. But this is the description of him provided by other people. And the reason, one of the wisdoms of why they would use such very intricate, very detailed and oftentimes complex words, was because they found it difficult to express what they witnessed in the Prophet ﷺ in any other way, shape or form. That they almost had to go and find the most fascinating words to describe the most fascinating man and individual that they had ever seen or interacted with. And so the very first narration, if you look within the text, the, what you see in the beginning of the text there, um, especially bolded in the text that you have in front of you, is what we call the Sanad, the chain of narration. This is the chain of narration from Imam Tirmidhi who authored the book, going back to where he is getting this narration from. And so I'll read through the chain of narration so that we are doing the book in its entirety. Um, but those are just names of individuals that he is receiving the narration by means of. So Imam Tirmidhi says, حَدَّثَنَا أَبُو رَجَا قُتَيْبَةُ بْنُ سَعِيدٍ عَنْ مَالِكِ بْنِ أَنَسِ This is the Imam Malik. عَنْ رَبِيعَةِ بْنِ أَبِي عَبْدِ الرَّحْمَانِ This is Rabi'atul Rai, one of the scholars of Medina, the teacher of Imam Malik. عَنْ أَنَسِ بْنِ مَالِكٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ This is the great Sahabi, the Rasul, the great companion of the Prophet ﷺ, Anas bin Malik. He was the third last Sahabi to pass away. So he lived, uh, the, he was the third uh, individual who had actually interacted with the Prophet ﷺ, the third last individual to be alive in this world who had interacted with the Prophet ﷺ. And in terms of duration of interaction and level of interaction, he was the last of the Sahaba who had spent a lot of time with the Prophet ﷺ to pass away. The couple of Sahaba who passed away after him had just interacted with the Prophet ﷺ sparingly. Once or twice, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the personal assistant. The word that's used in the Arabic, in the Arabic language is khadim. He was the personal assistant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he says that I served the Prophet sallallahu for 10 years. It's a very fascinating story that he says that, you know, his own biological father had passed away. And so when the Prophet sallallahu arrived in Medina, his mother took him to the Prophet ﷺ and she said, this is my boy Anas. He's, he's a very, very good boy. He's very, you know, well-behaved, well-mannered young man. He's very intelligent. His father passed away. I want him to have a good, positive, you know, male figure in his life. At the same time, his father was a poor man. He didn't really receive much inheritance from his father. I'm hoping that by serving you, by being with you, by learning from you, he will not only learn to be a man, but he will also be able to then find a way to be able to, you know, learn enough about responsibility to be able to make his own way in life. Because his father was not able to leave him anything. And now as a mother, I have other younger children as well. I don't know what I'm going to be able to provide for him. And so I basically offer him to you in your service. Let him be your assistant and let him serve you and learn from you. And so then he says, I spent 10 years being the personal assistant of the Prophet ﷺ. Up to 12 hours a day. He would basically be waiting on hand and foot for the Prophet ﷺ, running errands for him, going around with him, walking around with him, doing whatever needed to be done. So now this man, later on in his life, this young man, at that time, who so closely interacted with the Prophet ﷺ in such a critical time in his life, his teenage years, he describes, he says, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ لَيْسَ بِالطَّوِيلِ الْبَائِنِ وَلَا بِالْقَصِيرِ وَلَا بِالْأَبْيَضِ الْأَمْحَقِ وَلَا بِالْآدَمِ وَلَا بِالْجَعْدِ الْقَطَطِ وَلَا بِالسَّبَطِ بَعَثَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَلَىٰ رَأْسِ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً فَأَقَامَ بِمَكَّةَ عَشْرَ سِنِينَ وَبِالْمَدِينَةِ عَشْرَ سِنِينَ وَتَوَفَّاهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَلَىٰ رَأْسِ سِتِّينَ سَنَةً وَلَيْسَ فِي رَأْسِهِ وَلِحْيَتِهِ عِشْرُونَ رَأْسَةً بَيْضَىٰ So let me go ahead and just give you a brief translation then I'll explain some of the words. He says that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not extremely tall, nor was he extremely short. The Prophet ﷺ was not pale in his complexion. 
nor was he very dark skinned. The Prophet ﷺ did not have hair that was very curly, nor did he have hair that was extremely straight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him prophethood, messengerhood, at the age of 40. He lived in Mecca after that for 10 years, and he lived in Medina after that for 10 years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him back, meaning death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, took him back. The Prophet ﷺ passed away at the age of 60. And at the time that he passed away, in both of his head and his beard, his hair and his beard combined, he did not have even 20 white hairs combined. So he was still very youthful looking. Now, let me go ahead and explain some of this. So first and foremost, he describes that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi Now the word ba'in in the Arabic language means for something to be completely separated. Completely separated. And what that means in the Arabic language when you describe someone as at-tawilu al-ba'in, it's a way, if I'm going to use some common language here to try to expl- uh, explain or express the meaning of the expressions that they're using, the constructions that they're using, it's a way to call somebody freakishly tall. Right? When you say somebody is at-tawilu al-ba'in, it's like saying someone is freakishly tall. Not just a little tall, or a little bit taller than the average person, right? So maybe in a room, uh, somebody is standing there, they're six, uh, six two, six three, six four. They're a little bit taller than everyone. But then if somebody's like six nine or six ten or seven feet tall, then that's somebody that we usually kind of describe as being freakishly tall, extremely, overwhelmingly tall, right? That he says the Prophet ﷺ was not overwhelmingly tall. It's not like he was seven feet tall or six foot six. But the Prophet ﷺ had a good moderate height. One of the narrations that we're going to come across later on, it describes that the Prophet ﷺ was a little bit taller. When he would stand in a group of people, he seemed to be a little bit taller. Maybe an inch or two taller than the average height at that time. But again, not to the point where he was like a foot taller than everyone else in the room. وَلَا بِالْقَصِيدِ Nor was the Prophet ﷺ extremely short. So he was not under... Uh, shorter than the average height either. Then he goes on to describe, وَلَا بِالْأَبْيَضِ الْأَمْحَقِ Alright? Then he basically says that the Prophet ﷺ was not extremely white. Now the word that's used, أَمْحَق, is, it's derived from a stone that is very white. So he wasn't white like a stone. And what he means by that, he was not devoid of any type of color. He was not pale. Very extremely white. All right? And another narration that we're going to come across describes that the Prophet ﷺ did have a lighter complexion, but that lighter complexion had a lot of redness in it. So the Prophet ﷺ is described, another narration yet says that he had a wheat like complexion. All right? And then it describes him as Wala bil Adam. Adam is a word, now you might be thinking, Adam alayhi salam? No, alright? The root of the word, Adam in the Arabic language basically refers to dirt. That the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the same time did not have a very dark complexion like the color of the earth. Right? So at the, at the same time while the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not very pale like a stone, limestone, the, at the same time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not, did not have a dark complexion like that of the earth. So it's not a derogatory term. In fact, it was a very nice term that they would say that this person has a complexion of the earth. So they would describe it in a dignified manner. Just the fact of the matter is the Prophet ﷺ did not have that type of complexion. وَلَا بِالْجَعْدِ الْقَطِتِ Ja'ad in the Arabic language refers to hair being curly. And al-qatat uh, qatat rather refers to being very, very curly. Like almost, you know, curls in on itself. That the Prophet ﷺ did not have very extremely curly hair, where each and every single hair would curl in on itself. What up is sabt? Sabt in the Arabic language refers to something that is flowing, or something that is straight. That at the same time, he did not have very straight hair. So the Prophet ﷺ kind of had lightly curly, uh, or some describe as wavy type hair. Where once his hair got long, it did kind of like curl up into locks. 
that that was how the hair of the Prophet ﷺ was. بَعَثَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَلَىٰ رَأْسِ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً Of course, now this is the part that's familiar to us. He says that he was given the message, the mission at the age of 40. And that is something that we know very well, and that's something that's agreed upon. Then he says that after receiving the message and the mission, he resided in Mecca for 10 years. Now we of course know that the mission of the Prophet ﷺ, the Meccan period of his prophethood, his mission, was 13 years. Why is Anas ibn Malik saying 10 years? There's a couple of reasons why. First and foremost is that he's speaking either about the active preaching, that he preached publicly the message for 10 years. Because something else that we know from the life of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, is that the first three years of his prophethood were spent privately preaching the message, sharing the message with friends and family. He, was not public, he did not publicly proclaim the message and invite just the public of Mecca to the message. That he was given a three year period by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen himself, to become familiar with the message, and to also develop a very strong core, a nucleus around him that he would have to depend and rely upon when things in Mecca became extremely divisive and combative. Alright, so that's, he's discounting those first three years. The other thing about this is, at the same time, the Arabs at that time, it was not uncommon for them to basically, as we do as well, but it was not uncommon for them to round things off. Right? To round things off. So when he's saying 10, he's saying, it's like saying 10 some odd years. It's very common. And that's why he then goes on to say he spent 10 years in Medina, which is something, of course, it's accurate. The Prophet ﷺ did reside in Medina for 10 years. Medina to, Al-Madina to Al-Munawwara, the illuminated city of Medina. But then when he says that he passed away at the age of 60, this is again the issue of rounding down, because the Prophet ﷺ passed away at the age of 63. And that's something that we have very authentic accounts about, and something we know very well, it's very well documented. So again, this is just an issue of rounding it down. But then he says something very fascinating. He says that even at the age of 60, or 63 as we know, that the Prophet ﷺ did not have a total, he had less than 20 total white hairs in his head and in his beard. I obviously have not beat. Alright? So the Prophet ﷺ had less than 20 ha white hairs in his beard and in his hair. And again, why was this? Of course, this was the youthfulness of the Messenger ﷺ. But also there is a divine, right? Obviously everything happens by the command of Allah. Obviously we know that. But particularly in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, there's a very specific divine design that, is, that can be observed, that can be seen. And so the Prophet ﷺ, multiple things. There's so much sharh about just this idea about how few white hairs the Prophet ﷺ had. There's so much fascination about this. That number one, the Prophet ﷺ wasn't just the preacher, the messenger, the preacher, the teacher, the imam. Right? The educator, the counselor. He wasn't just those things. He was also the military leader. He would also lead the soldiers into battle. And so the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maintained the youthful appearance of the Prophet wasallam to inspire that confidence. That when young men and young soldiers were following him into battle, they didn't feel like they were following some old man into battle to their death or their demise. No, no, they were inspired by the Messenger ﷺ because he looked as old as they did. He still looked like he was in his 30s, in his 40s. Very youthful looking. The other thing they also talk about this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet ﷺ, not just obviously in his words and in his ideas and in his teaching, but even in his appearance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet ﷺ the ability to connect with anyone and everyone. Right? Everyone just felt a connection to him. And so the Prophet ﷺ remained extremely effective, even, well in, even into his 60s, early 60s, he remained extremely effective in preaching and teaching to young people. Children, teenagers, young people. They still connected with him because visibly, he was not somebody that came across to them as being very, very extremely old. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a number of the white hairs, right? Why? Because at the same time, to impress 
to somebody that you are still dealing with somebody who's older than you. <coughs> to impress a sense of respect. To give, obviously, this a messenger of Salah, so there's no question of wisdom. But again, we're talking about when you first saw him from a distance. You still recognize this is somebody who knows what he's talking about. This is somebody with a certain amount of experience. And there are, there's a certain dignity to white hair as well. There are hadith of the Prophet ﷺ um, in numerous books of a hadith that also talk about the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show respect, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be lenient with elderly people on the day of judgment. That He will account them more leniently, right? With greater lenience. Because of just the life and the experiences and, you know, just the difficulty that they might have endured in living the life that they lived, right? So all of that kind of factored into a very, again, specific, very precise definition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave, physically even, to the Prophet ﷺ. Hadith number two. Imam Tirmidhi says, حَدَّثَنَا حُمَيْدُ بْنُ مَسْعَدَةَ الْبَصْرِ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا عَبْدُ الْوَهَابَ الثَّقَفِي عَنْ حُمَيْدَ عَنْ أَنَسِ بْنِ مَالِكِ رضي الله تعالى عنه قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ربعة ليس بالطويل ولا بالقصير حسن الجسم وكان شعره ليس بجعد ولا سبط أسمر اللون إذا مشى يتكفأ the, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu relates the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a very moderate build. Raba'atan means that he was of moderate build. He was not extremely thin or frail, nor was he very extremely overweight. But the Prophet sallallahu was of a moderate build. He was not very tall, nor was he very short. He was very handsome and very um, beautiful in his physical appearance. Hassan al-Jism. He was very beautiful and handsome in his physical appearance. His hair was not extremely curry, curly, nor was his hair very straight. Asmar al He had a very wheatish complexion. When he used to walk, he would slightly lean forward he would slightly lean or hunch forward when he walked. All right? Now again, some of the things we've come across, the moderate build of the Prophet ﷺ is actually something that's coming up, so I'm going to save it for there. Inshallah, there's a greater description provided about what was that moderate build. Um, we've talked about the height of the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, Hassan al-Jism refers to the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was very handsome when you looked at him. You were just impressed by looking at him. You were just immediately impressed when you looked at him. And then of course it describes his hair, which we've talked about as well. The color of the complexion of his skin. Now a new detail is provided here. Which we'll have more detail coming up. When he would walk, it was almost like he would kind of lean or hunch a little forward. Now, what comes into discussion here a lot of times is the issue of posture, right? We've always been taught to have good posture, right? And that's what's very interesting is that when the Prophet ﷺ would sit, he had extremely good posture. The Prophet ﷺ would not lean against things when he would sit. He didn't lean back, he didn't lean over to the side, he didn't hunch forward, right? The Prophet ﷺ wasn't one of those people that just couldn't sit straight. You know, I'm basically describing all of us. Alright? So the Prophet ﷺ wasn't one of those people that just couldn't sit straight. Some people you just like, like if you're trying to talk to them something very serious and maintain eye contact, it's like you have to keep shifting. Right? They'll lay down like this, they'll sprawl out. Then they'll sit up and lean over. Then they'll very awkwardly hunch forward almost to the ground. Then they'll lean back. Right, then halfway through the late, like that was the Prophet ﷺ when he sat, he wouldn't lean against something and he would sit very straight. So he had extremely good posture. This is not describing the fact that the Prophet ﷺ had terrible posture. Right? No, he would sit, he had very good posture. But when he would walk, the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't walk like this kind of chest out, shoulders back, head up. The Prophet ﷺ didn't walk around like this. Because that is intimidating. That gives the air of kind of arrogance. Right? 
Like the Quran says, وَلَن تَخْرِقَ الْجِبَالُ وَلَن تَخْرِقَ الْأَرْضَ وَلَن تَبْلُغَ الْجِبَالَ طُولًا You will not tear the earth as you walk through it. Right? وَقْصِدْ فِي مَشِيكٍ Right? You're not going to reach the height of mountains. So therefore, be moderate in how you walk. The Quran talks about this as well. Right? In Surah Luqman. So similarly, the Prophet ﷺ, when he would walk though, he would not um, stick his chest out, have his head, head held up, shoulders back. But when he would walk around in public, the Prophet ﷺ, to be a little less intimidating, the Prophet ﷺ would walk very humbly. He would kind of hunch forward with an air of humility. Right? And so to not be intimidating, number one, and number two, not to come off as arrogant, and to seem very approachable, to be very kind. All right? So, and there's going to be a little bit more detail that we'll talk about in regards to this. Hadith number three. The, uh, Imam al Tirmidhi says, Haddathana Muhammad ibn Bashar, Qala Haddathana Muhammad ibn Ja'far, Qala Haddathana Shu'aba, An Abi Ishaq, قال سمعت البراء ابن عازب رضي الله تعالى عنه يقول كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رجلا مربوعا بعيد ما بين المنكبين عظيم الجمة إلى شحمة أذنيه اليسرى عليه حلة حمراء ما رأيت شيئا قد أحسن منه The Prophet of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم is described as so Bara bin Azib radiallahu ta'ala anhu another young sahabi he describes the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam he says that he was a very moderately uh, built man rajulan marbu'an a very moderately built man he was his shoulders were very broad his shoulders naturally were very broad he had long hair. He had long hair. He would grow his hair out. And Azimul Jumma refers to hair that basically reaches to the neck, right? The lower part of the neck. And specifically, what, the reason, well, obviously, right? Even if you have short hair, your hair comes down to your neck, obviously, back here. What that makes reference to is the fact that even the hair from like the, the, the locks of his hair were so long that the hair from the front would hang back toward, to his neck. And because again of the curliness, slight curliness of the hair of the Prophet it would curl up around his earlobes. So it would curl up around his earlobes. And so the Prophet so again going back to the translation, Rajulan Marbu'an, he was a very moderately built man, he was very broad, his shoulders were broad, his hair had, he had long locks of hair that would fall and curl up around his earlobes. He was wearing a red striped cloth. All right, he was wearing a, a cloth, he was wearing clothes that had red stripes on them, dark red, like almost maroon stripes on it. I never saw anything more beautiful than that. I never saw anything more beautiful than him. Alright? Now what is he exactly describing? So we've talked about the moderate build of the Prophet ﷺ and it's going to have a little bit more detail. It now describes that he was very broad chested, kind of wide chested, wide shoulders. It then describes that fact that the Prophet ﷺ would grow his hair out long. So the Prophet ﷺ would grow his hair out. Now, how would exactly, and there's going to be a specific chapter about the hair of the Prophet ﷺ, but just a little bit of detail, when the Prophet ﷺ would grow his hair out, the way that he would wear his hair, if you want to call it that, is that he would basically have his hair going back. And naturally his hair would kind of part in the middle. But the Prophet ﷺ would basically wear his hair back. All right, And because his hair would fall back, and again it was curly, the, the locks would kind of start to curl towards uh, the back of his head, and then they would basically curl up, and you would see that, like locks of hair curling up around his earlobes and coming up. And that was what the Prophet ﷺ looked like. What it's describing about the clothing of the Prophet ﷺ, and again there will be a chapter specifically about his clothing, it's describing a particular garment the Prophet ﷺ had, and this was actually one of the nicer garments that he had, that he would sometimes wear on a Friday, or he would wear even at the occasion of Eid, or special occasions, that he had this shawl. He had this shawl that was black, and it had like dark red stripes on it. 
like thread, there were, there were red threads that were put in the middle of the black cloth. So he had this black shawl that had these dark red stripes on it. And that's what he's describing. So he says that the Prophet ﷺ being broad chested, a very moderately built man with his hair falling back and curling up around his earlobes. And I saw him sitting there wearing this dark black shawl with the red stripes on it. And he said, I've never seen anything more beautiful than what I saw on that day. He was just breathtaking to look at. And so he's describing the Prophet ﷺ on a particular day when he looked at him. And he said, I've never seen anything more beautiful than that. Hadith number four. Imam Tirmidhi says, حدثنا محمود بن غيلان قال حدثنا وكيع قال حدثنا سفيان عن أبي إسحاق عن البراء بن عازب رضي الله تعالى عنه قال ما رأيت من ذي ما رأيت من ذي لمة في حلة حمراء أحسن من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم له شعر يضرب منكبيه بعيد ما بين المنكبين لم يكن بالقصير ولا بالطويل Again, let me just give you a basic translation. He says, Bara ibn Azib radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, I never saw anyone with long hair wearing a black shawl with red stripes on it more beautiful than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Meaning, I never saw anyone more beautiful than the Prophet sallallahu with his long hair wearing that shawl. He had hair that would sometimes fall to his shoulders. So because the hair of the Prophet ﷺ was curly, when it would kind of dry up, it would kind of curl up in the back. But sometimes when he would comb it or when his hair was wet, and it would hang down because of the water, then it would even start to kind of touch his shoulders. Like it would touch the top of his shoulders. So he had hair that would touch the top of his shoulders. He was very broad. His shoulders were very broad. He was not very short, nor was he extremely tall. The next narration, حدثنا, Imam Tirmidhi says, حدثنا Muhammad ibn Ismail, this is Imam Bukhari, قال حدثنا Abu Nu'aym, قال حدثنا المسعودي عن Uthman ibn Muslim ibn Hurmuz, عن نافع ibn Jubair ibn Mut'im, عن Ali ibn Abi Talib رضي الله تعالى عنه قال, this of course Ali رضي الله عنه, لم يكن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بالطويل ولا بالقصير. شثن الكفين إن وند في لغة شثن الكفين شثن الكفين والقدمين ضخم الرأس ضخم الكراديس طويل المسربة إذا مشى تكفأ تكفؤا كأنما ينحط من صبب لم أرى قبله ولا بعده مثله The fifth narration, which Imam Tirmidhi narrates from Imam Bukhari, going all the way back to Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, a rough translation, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was not extremely tall, nor was he extremely short. He had thick hands and feet. He had a very, he had a large head. His joints were also very thick. He had a long line of hair going down the middle of his chest and belly. When he would walk, he would slightly lean forward. It was almost as if he was walking down, descending from a high place. He was walking down a decline. I never saw before him or anyone and he, I never saw anyone like him before him or after him. I never ever again saw anyone like him. Now let me explain a couple of things now because there's a couple of new details that Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, of course, who knew the Prophet sallallahu better than Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This was somebody who was raised in the home of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He was the second person to accept Islam at the tender age of 10. He lived with the Prophet sallallahu from the age of 6 or 7. He was married to the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is somebody who grew up. The Prophet sallallahu effectively raised him. All right, and so he says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his hands and his feet were thick. And when we when I say that, that sounds almost kind of weird or even negative. So you have to now understand the expression in the Arabic language. 
This is where literal translations do not work. You have to understand how these expressions were used by the people when they were used. That the Arabs, how they would use this as an expression. Saying, somebody, saying that someone had thick hands and thick feet meant that somebody was very strong. So he says that the Prophet was very strong. He was very firm-handed and very firm-footed. Like the Prophet was not somebody that you would see dropping something. The Prophet was not somebody that you would see losing his balance. He was strong. When he says, ras, he had a big head. Again, it's not saying that he had a freakishly large head. Right? But it means that the Prophet ﷺ, and this is a narration, the clarification comes later on, that the Prophet ﷺ had a large forehead. His forehead was very open. All right, so that's sort of what he's alluding to. Now, when you play, when you put the two pieces together, you first of all learn that the Prophet ﷺ had a very large, open forehead, and then you also factor in that he had long hair. So it gave the appearance as if the head of the Prophet ﷺ was very large because his forehead was big, right? And he had very long hair, so he was his face, his head was very prominent. You noticed him. That's what it means. Dakhmur ras. You noticed him. All right. Then it says, Dakhmul Karadis. The Prophet ﷺ had very thick joints. Again, it's not saying that he had some deformity or arthritis or something. What it means is that the Prophet ﷺ was very strong. Again, it's saying that he was very strong. Alright? Very sure-handed, sure-footed. He was very strong. Tawilul Masraba. Now here it describes that from his chest down to his navel, the Prophet ﷺ had a long line of hair that went down from his chest to his navel. And this is something that's coming up in a narration later on. Why would he describe the fact that he had a line of hair going down from his chest to his navel? Because the Prophet ﷺ did not have a lot of hair on his body other than that. That generally speaking, the Prophet ﷺ did not have a lot of hair on his chest or even on his stomach, but he had this line of hair that went down from his chest to his navel. He says that when he would walk, he was again inclined forward. And it was almost, it looked as if, imagine somebody walking down some steps. Right? Imagine somebody kind of walking down a hill. That was the appearance of the Prophet ﷺ when he walked. And he said, I never saw anyone ever like him ever again. Hadith number six is one of those repetitions that I was talking about. Imam Tirmidhi rahimullah ta'ala, he says, حَدَّثَنَا سُفْيَانُ بْنُ وَكِيعَ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا أَبِي عَنِ الْمَسْعُودِ بِهَذَا الْإِسْنَادِ نَحْوَهُ بِمَعْنَاهُ That he narrates, um, and he says that the beginning of the chain is different. Instead of the previous narration, he got it from Imam Bukhari. And Imam Bukhari got it from his teacher Abu Nu'aym who then got it from Mas'udi. This is a different narration that, that comes from the teacher of Imam Tirmidhi, Sufyan ibn Waqir, who says, I got this narration from my teacher, who got it from Mas'udi, and then the rest of the narration is the same. It goes back to Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and then the narration is identical. They would just do this to basically establish the fact, I was able to get this narration through two different chains. The seventh and the... Alright, there's just... Alright. So the seventh and the final narration that we're going to be covering today, Imam Tirmidhi says, حَدَّثَنَا أَحْمَدُ بْنُ عَبْدَةَ الضَّبِّي الْبَصْرِي وَعَلِي بْنُ حُجَرْ وَأَبُو جَعْفَرْ مُحَمَّدُ بْنُ الْحُسَيْنِ وَهُوَ إِبْنْ أَبِي حَلِيمَ وَالْمَعْنَى وَاحِدٌ Alright? So basically, these were... Three different names that the first, same person was basically known by. All right, three and um, so the the last three where it says Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Hussein wa huwa ibn Abi Halima that's the same person, but there are three different individuals that Imam Tirmidhi gets this narration from. All right, so Imam Tirmidhi gets this narration from three people. He found the same narration from three different teachers: Ahmad ibn Abda, 
Ali ibn Hujar and Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Hussein. And Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Hussein was more popularly known as Ibn Abi Halima. Well, ma'na wahid. All right. Qalu, he, they all say, Haddathana Isa ibn Yunus an Umar ibn Abdullah, Mawla Ghufra. Qala haddathani Ibrahim ibn Muhammad min waladi Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Qal kana aliyun radiyallahu anhu idha wasafa Rasulallahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama. Qal lam yakun Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama bit tawilil mummaghit. Wala bil qasiril mutaraddid. وكان ربعة من القوم لم يكن بالجعد القطت قطت ولا بالسبت كان جعدا رجلا ولم يكن بالمطهم ولا بالمكلثم وكان في وجهه تدوير أبيض مش مشرب أدعج العينين أهدب الأشفار جليل المشاش والكتد أجرد ذو مسربة شثن الكفين والقدمين إذا مشاك أن ما ينحط في سبب وإذا التفت التفت معا بين كتفيه خاتم النبوة وهو خاتم النبيين أجود الناس صدرا وأصدق الناس لهجة وألينهم عريكة وأكرمهم عشرة من رآه بهديهة هابه ومن خالته معرفة أحبه يقول ناعته لم أرى قبله ولا بعده مثله صلى الله عليه وسلم I'm going to give you a basic translation and I'll explain some of the interesting concepts. Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, or rather one of the uh, children of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, um, he says that Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, whenever he used to describe the Prophet sallallahu to us, he would say, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not extremely tall, nor was he very short. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a very moderate height and build. His hair was not extremely curly, nor was his hair completely straight. Rather, it was very moderately curly, kind of wavy. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not very heavy set, nor was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nor did he have a very a heavy face. Rather, his face had a certain symmetry to it. The Prophet sallallahu was of a more lighter complexion with some color added to it. His eyes were very dark, very deep. His eyelashes were long. His shoulders were very broad. His shoulders were very broad. He didn't have a lot of hair on his body. Ajrad, he did not have a lot of hair on his body. He just had that one line of hair that went down from his chest to his navel. He was very strong, very sure-handed and sure-footed. When he walked, it was as if he was walking down a hill. When he turned, he turned completely. When he turned to face someone, to speak to someone, he turned completely. Between his shoulder blades was the seal of prophethood. And he was the seal of all the prophets. He was the most generous of people, the most open-hearted of people. He was the most well-spoken of people. وَأَلْيَنُهُمْ عَرِيكَةً And he came from the most... وَأَلْيَنُهُمْ عَرِيكَةً That he was the most softest in how he dealt with people. He came from the most noblest of families. If somebody saw him all of a sudden, for the first time, they would be overwhelmed. But when somebody interacted with him and got to know him, they fell in love with him. Anyone who ever described him, 
anyone that would ever describe him would say, I never ever again saw, I never before him or after him saw anyone like him. I never saw anyone like him. Now, just to explain a few of the concepts uh, that he talks about here, specifically, the, some of the new concepts that he mentions is, he says, Attawilil mummaghit. All right? That's basically the same, that's why the word is so difficult. It's a way in classical Arabic to basically say freakishly tall. So he was not freakishly tall. وَلَا بِالْقَصِيرِ الْمُتَرَدِّدِ At the same time, he wasn't so short that you had trouble finding him in a crowd. Then it goes on to describe the hair of the Prophet ﷺ, which we've talked about already. Then it says, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ بِالْمُطَهَّمْ Mutahham basically means very heavy set. Like the Prophet ﷺ was not overweight. He was not heavy set. وَلَا بِالْمُكَلْثَمْ what this basically means is sometimes when people are a little bit more heavy set, their face will also be very heavy. All right? Describing it very kindly. Understand what I'm saying. All right? So he said that the Prophet ﷺ was not somebody who was physically very heavy set, nor was his face very heavy. But he did have a certain symmetry to his face, he had definitions to his face. All right? Then it describes the complexion of the Prophet ﷺ, which we've already talked about. He had a lighter complexion, but it had some color to it. Now it describes, this is the first time the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ are being described. Ad'aj al Ad'aj. Ad'aj in the Arabic language, typically a lot of times, it's used to describe shadidu siwad al ayn. Shadidu siwad al ayn. Right? To, be, to have very dark eyes. Now, scholars have kind of explained this in different ways. One thing that we do know for certain is that the pupils of the Prophet ﷺ were very dark. His pupils were very dark. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't have like light colored eyes. But his eyes were dark. And the second thing that this also describes is overall they would describe his eyes as kind of being very... Another thing that Ad'aj kind of refers to is something when it's a little bit deeper, it's a little bit darker, that he had very deep eyes. Very deep eyes. Right? Like you feel like you could like look into his eyes. Right? He had very deep eyes. Very welcoming eyes. The next thing it says, Ahdabul Ashfar. That basically is as it says that the Prophet ﷺ had long eyelashes. Jalilul Mushashi wal Katad wal Katad. Jalilul Mushashi wal Katad basically refers to the fact that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ he had very large, broad shoulders. Very large, broad shoulders, very strong. He had a very strong build. So while he wasn't extremely heavy set or anything, or freakishly huge or big, at the same time the Prophet ﷺ just had this look about him that he seemed like he was strong, like he could handle himself. Alright? He had very strong, uh, had a strong build. When he would walk, now this is why it's so astounding. This is somebody who's a little bit taller than average. This is somebody who has very broad shoulders. This is somebody who has a very youthful appearance. This is somebody who has a very strong build. He looks like he could handle himself. And when he walks though, it looked like he was walking downhill. He had a very hum he had this beautiful humility to him. This unassumingness to him. He didn't, own, he didn't walk down the street like he owned the place. But he mixed in with people. All right? And there will be other narrations that will tell us this. And after describing the fact, two things. The first that the Prophet ﷺ was very imposing physically. Like he was very impressive physically. He wasn't arrogant, so he walked with humility. At the same time, his humility was not to the point where it made him antisocial. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't weird. Right? Like when you spoke to him, he was just like... Right? That the Prophet ﷺ wasn't like that. When he spoke to somebody, he would turn to them with his chest, and he would speak to them. 
right? You would turn إِذَا إِلْتَفَتَ إِلْتَفَتَ مَعَنْ When you would turn, you would turn completely to somebody, make eye contact with that person, face that person and speak to them. Right? He was very forthcoming, he was very open. All right? And so this is how he's described. The other thing, and we'll talk about this when you get to the akhlaq, the other thing that is very remarkable or very noteworthy about this is this is the character and the dignity with which the Messenger ﷺ conducted himself. He's a messenger of Allah Sallallahu He is the most important human being that has ever lived. Right? We talk about somebody being important. I'm very busy. I'm very important. Go, go. Talk, talk. What? Right? I'm busy. I'm important. Right? That's the impression that we get. Nobody was busier. Nobody was important than the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He literally had the weight of the world on his shoulders. That's not an expression. He literally did. إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا Bashir, he literally did have the weight of the world on his shoulders. Nobody was busier, nobody was more preoccupied, nobody had more to do than he did. Yet, when somebody came to talk to him, he stopped what he was doing, he turned towards that person, didn't just look up or glance up at that person, no, he turned towards that person, gave them his full 100% attention, and spoke to them. And the reason why he describes, like it's repetition. Because when you're standing, okay, you can turn and face. When you're sitting, it's difficult to turn and face somebody. You have to completely reposition yourself. He would do that. But he made sure that when he spoke to somebody, they felt like they were seen, heard, listened to, noticed, attended to. They felt special. Right? They felt validated, appreciated, respected. Right? And that's how the Prophet would speak to people. And then he says, between his shoulder blades was the seal of prophethood. Now there's going to be a chapter specifically about the seal of prophethood. But just very briefly here, when we get to the chapter, you'll see it in more detail. What it, ba- what it was, was that it was, it's described as almost like a cluster of moles that was on the middle of his back, on his upper back between his shoulder blades. It was like a cluster of moles. And this is described as the seal of prophethood. There's a very beautiful, fascinating story that will occur in the chapter um, narrated by Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu when we get to that particular narration. And so I'll save it for over there inshallah. But it's a very fascinating, beautiful narration about Salman al-Farisi looking for that seal of prophethood on the back of the Prophet So he had the seal of prophethood and then he says because he was the finality of all the prophets and messengers. Now he describes a little bit about the, just the demeanor, the character of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, Ajwadun nasi sadaran. Ajwad means generous, and nas of the people. Sadaran means chest. But of course it refers to the heart. Like his heart was so big, his heart, chest could barely contain his heart. It's like an expression in Arabic saying, his heart was so big, his chest couldn't even contain his heart. He had room for everybody. He had time for everybody. He had love for everybody. Right? Most generous of people. And when you, a lot of times we think generosity, we just think money. No, no, no. He was generous with his time. He was generous with his affection. He was generous with his love. Which is a lot more harder to come by than, generous, than people that are generous with their money. That's harder to find. Right? Many people that can write a check can't make a minute for somebody, can't make time for somebody. So it's true generosity. When you can be generous with your love and your affection and your attention. وَأَصْدَقُ النَّاسِ لَهْجَةً He was the most truthful in his speech. He was the most truthful in his speech. Like he never lied to you. He never deceived you. He never said something to you that, you that didn't sit well with you. You never felt like he lied or cheated you. Right? وَأَلْيَنُهُمْ عَرِيكَةً Right? عَرِيكَةً in the Arabic language basically refers to someone's demeanor. Someone's demeanor. Like someone's natural disposition is called عَرِيكَةً Arak, right? They would say, Fulanun linul arika. 
And so it refers to natural disposition. Basically, it refers to someone's default conduct and behavior. By default, the Prophet ﷺ was gentle. He only was harsh when the need arose. His default mode was gentleness. He's very gentle, by default. وَأَكْرَمُهُمْ عِشْرَةً he was, he was of the most noblest, he was the most noble in terms of family. Now again, this is not only complementing the fact that the Prophet ﷺ came from a very noble lineage, a noble family, but it also means that he was the most noblest in his conduct with his family. And this is something else that we'll come across when we get to the akhlaq of the Prophet ﷺ. But this is a very common predicament. There's a very fascinating story. It's in uh, the books of Hadith as well, which the, a negative description, a negative description of a man that they would have at that time is that إِذَا خَرَجَ asada, وَإِذَا دَخَلَ fahida, Right? That they would say when he goes outside, he's like a lion. Meaning in terms of like dignity and honor and presence. And when he enters into the home, he's like a leopard, right? And so what they would basically mean by that is, and this is a very common predicament that we find, sometimes people are very well-spoken, very dignified, very well-mannered, right? In their public conduct and behavior. And inside the home, complete opposite. They take the people around them for granted. They don't conduct themselves in a very dignified manner, very disrespectful, a lot of disregard, so on and so forth. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was at his most noble. Think about how noble his public conduct was. His private conduct with his family was even more dignified, was even more respectful, was even more noble. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in another narration says, "Ahsanukum, ahsanukum li ahlihi, wa na ahsanukum li ahli." That the best amongst you is the one who is the best to his family. And I am the best from amongst you when it, with my family. That that's what really defines the worth of a man. The worth of any human being. Is how do they conduct themselves with the people that are closest to them, that are the easiest to take for granted, that probably aren't going to go anywhere. Right? If I disrespect or I misbehave with my parents, what are they going to do? Disown me? They couldn't even if they tried. Right? I just show up again. Right? I'm resilient. Right? But they, how, they, how I conduct myself with them and how they conduct themselves with me. How I conduct myself with my wife and how she conducts herself with me. Right? The people that are closest to you. The people that will put up with you no matter what. Don't make them put up with anything no matter what. Right? And that was who the Prophet ﷺ was. And this is somebody who lived in the home of the Prophet ﷺ, who saw him, how he interacted with his wife and his children. And is saying about him, I never saw somebody who was more dignified with his family. And then he says, if you walk through the door and laid eyes on the, on the Prophet ﷺ the very first time, you would be a little overwhelmed. You'd be taken aback. Like you would take your breath away for a second. Like, wow. He just had that presence about him. He just took your breath away. But the second you spoke to him, you fell in love with him. Ahabbahu. He won your heart. The second you interacted with him or spoke to him. Yaqulu na'itu. And this is the eloquence of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says, anyone who ever interacted with the Prophet or saw him, and if you asked him to describe him, Without fail, they would say, "Lam ara qablahu wa la ba'dahu mithlahu." Never before him or after him did I ever see or meet anyone even close to him. I never met anyone like him. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. All right. So we'll go ahead and stop here, inshallah, and we will uh, pick up from the eighth uh, narration and try to finish the chapter, inshallah, tomorrow. Uh, I know that a couple of people had. Sister, I'd also raise your hand for a question. So if anybody's got any questions, I'll take it at the, every day at the end of the dars, uh, because they're recording this as well for the benefit of other students and things like that. So inshallah, I'll take the questions at the end of the dars. Yes. Right. 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 <laughs> right. 
Uh, better to avoid. Yeah, better to avoid. <laughs> right, that's something that uh, most scholars have usually had a lot of reservations about. Not only because of the hadith of tasawir, of drawing living creatures and beings, but then also to not seem uh, to have done the Prophet ﷺ any type of injustice when you actually physically draw him out. So it's best to avoid that altogether, obviously. Um, one second, Sister Tanya, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah, um, I was confused about how the Hindu tradition has like, uh, each stem forward and beyond. Like, how does it work? Like, how does it work? Right. They basically just say that it almost seemed like he was on that he was standing at a, at a decline. That's what it means. So it's like, it just seemed like he was kind of tilted a little bit. Exactly. Yeah, no, it just seemed like he was like slightly declined. Right? He was always leaning forward a little bit. Sister Noor? Right, it's described as Mithla Tufaha. And we're going to go through a whole chapter on it, but basically it's, what they mean more so by that is that it was an actual protrusion from his skin. So it wasn't just a seal like a mark, like flat with his skin, it actually stuck out a little bit. That's what, so in the, in the classical Arabic language, and we would call something Mithla Tufaha, because another narration says Mithla Al-Bayda. It was like an egg. And what they just mean by that is it actually protruded from his skin. No, no, not like that. It wasn't like a shape drawn out, but it was almost a cluster together to the point where it kind of stuck out like that on his back. Um, Ahmed. Yes, um, so very briefly, uh, one very famous commentary is by Alama Bajuri. Bajuri, it's just known as Sharhul Bajuri. I think it's called Al Mawahibul Laduniya. Um, there's Ashraful Wasail, Fi Sharhi Shamail, um, and then there's a couple more. I can actually share them with you, inshallah. All right. Muhammad? Very good. So this kind of goes back to an earlier conversation that we had in the class this morning about the technical definition of the word sunnah. So we understand that anything pertaining to the life of the Prophet ﷺ, historically speaking, is called sunnah. But legal, legally speaking, not all of it is sunnah. Meaning we're not strongly recommended to do all of it. So a lot of what we're, this text is basically a text, and I will clarify for you kind of based on the chapter that we're going through, but generally speaking, this text is the text of, a sun, of the sunnah from a historical perspective, not so much from a legal perspective. When we do come across something that maybe is also recommended, I'll definitely clarify that. But generally speaking, you can understand it to be more of a historical documentation of the sunnah rather than a legal uh, analysis of the sunnah. All right? Yes, brother? Right. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's a much more eloquent expression. Right? Instead of saying that, Aynehi Muda'ajataini or something of that nature, saying, Ad'ajul Aynehi, right, is just more expressive. It's a lot more emphatic. Right? Yes. How does a common person differentiate what's recommended as opposed to what you just said? Mm. Very good. So the brother's question is that talking about the same thing in terms of what is sunnah in terms of uh, just historical documentation versus what is actually recommended. Um, you basically require some type of explanation or some type of sharh or direction from somebody knowledgeable within the science itself. It's very difficult to figure out. It takes a lot to figure all that out. Yes? Was obligatory or recommended for us, this would be 
So, so the brother's question is that to what extent is what the Prophet ﷺ did, maybe in terms of what he wore, how he looked, and things like that, to what extent could it even be, you know, not even recommended um, in terms of his physical description? So what you have to understand is that there are certain things, obviously. Now, somebody, you know, um, even to the point of mutilating themselves to try to seem or appear in the physical description, right? That was the khalq, how God created him physically, to try to be more like the Prophet so would actually be reprehensible. That'd be bad. That was never the point or the objective. Then there are certain things that, you know, are optional, such as growing out your hair a little bit longer. Those are not necessarily recommended, but what's generally said about that is that if somebody does it, out of just admiration and love of the Prophet ﷺ, then it is a noteworthy practice. It would be good for that person too, but isn't necessarily recommended in the same sense. All right? Um, so that's kind of just, uh, I mean, to a certain degree, it's some type of, uh, a certain amount of common sense. But what we also understand is that things that were actually part of his character or his actions are more so what's recommended, uh, not so much the physical description itself. Yes? Right. So there's some analysis about this particular idea. Um, I would love to tell you that we'll talk about it when we get there, but I know we're not going to get there. So the Imam Tirmidhi kind of, he places the chapter about seeing the Prophet ﷺ in a dream at the end of his book. Some people have kind of interpreted that to say that after reading through all of this and kind of visualizing the Prophet ﷺ and really internalizing what he looked like, it would actually aid somebody seeing in his dream. And that's what Imam Tirmidhi, he structures his book accordingly. Not so much, more so what Imam Tirmidhi did was, he, he, he actually in another place, he states his intent for placing that chapter last. He says the reason why, he said this chapter doesn't even belong in this book. The only reason why I placed it here towards the very end, almost as an extra section or an appendix, was for the purpose, the reason that the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ reminded me. That the Prophet ﷺ says, مَنْ رَآنِي فِي الْمَنَامِ فَقَدْ رَآنِي Right, that whoever saw me in his dream actually saw me. What that means is, shaitan cannot present himself to try to trick you or deceive you in your dream in the form of the Prophet ﷺ. And so he says, based on that, that just kind of occurred to me, and that's why I placed it here, but there's nothing really scientific, there's nothing formulaic, that if you kind of go through this whole study, then that results in then seeing him in a dream, that just creates unnecessary expectations, right? Seeing the Prophet ﷺ in your dream is definitely a really special experience, but is not necessarily indicative of any type of achievement of a particular level of piety, um, or vice versa, it, it really doesn't say anything at all. It's actually what, what's been documented a lot more by some of the scholars, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, they've all written like treaties and little texts about seeing the Prophet ﷺ in one's dream. What they actually document is if you went around kind of like hearing stories, you find people that are more struggling in their spirituality, more so than the pious, they are actually more prone to see the Prophet ﷺ in their dream than the more pious are. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowing you to see the Prophet ﷺ in your dream oftentimes serves as a, uh, as a reinforcement at a time of great tragedy or difficulty. That somebody's teetering on the edge of faith. Somebody's losing their iman. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant this to reaffirm them and strengthen them. So if you got any other questions, I'll take them tomorrow in the class. Um, let's go ahead and wrap it up for tonight. I promise the dars will not be this long every night. Uh, today just because of the introduction it will win a little bit longer but our goal and objective is going to be try to wrap things up by 9.15 inshallah uh, so that everybody's back and in bed on time inshallah and be able to roll the next morning Jazakumullah khairan I will see the Sira intensive students class uh, Sira intensive students in class in the morning Assalamu alaikum